you know, one of the um, benefits of traveling around to all these different churches that we do is that um, I only have to prepare like one or two sermons and just over and over again. But on the downside of that, I find that every time I go back to my notes from the sermon and I go to give it, it's different. And so Jimmy was uh, talking with me earlier. He said, how many times have you given the sermon? And I said, I think this is going to be the fourth or, or fifth time. But you know what? It's never been the same. And so I keep always having to adjust my notes. So um, we'll see what happens with it this morning. Before we start, uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. And Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit here to be with us, to give us a blessing through your word. Lord, as I, as I read the scriptures and try to give a meaning and depth behind your word that you've revealed to me, I just ask that um, you give us the spirit of understanding, help us to uh, search the scriptures on a daily basis and just find that blessing for ourselves. Lord, that each one of us can find messages and meanings and stories and just joy in reading the Word of God. And so that is what I plan to share today, Lord. I thank you and uh, just ask you to be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so my sermon title today is called Full Soul. And I, the, uh, the scripture that we started with was from Proverbs 27, verse 7. And I choose that one because I feel that it describes my life and probably many of our lives to the T, almost. And um, it says, The full soul loathes the honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. So we're going to unpack that verse a little bit this morning. But let me start off by asking you, how many of you have ever been hungry? Everyone can probably raise your hand, right? All right, now how many of you have ever been so hungry that you would have eaten anything? Maybe not that bad. I can remember my, my senior year in, uh, no, my junior year in high school, me and my uh, best friend, who's now my brother-in-law, we were getting ready to go on a, a camping trip. So what we wanted to do is we said, hey, let's see how long that we can fast and go without food to prepare ourselves for going on this. We were going to go on a week-long camping trip. We were going to skip school for a week and then stay gone the whole weekend too. We were just going to go away we figured it would be too much to pack enough food for an entire week. So if we could ration out the food, you know, it was, so we just wanted to see, you know, how long can we go without eating? I'll tell you, we made it almost 24 hours before we were just so hungry that when we came to school, it was a Friday um, afternoon for lunch and the school cafeteria was serving my least favorite meal, but it tasted so good on that day because I had not eaten for 24 hours. It was so good. How many of you have ever been full? Yeah? Some of you? I'm sure there's more of you than that, but how many of you have been so full that someone could have set your favorite dish in front of you, and you just have to push it away? I cannot eat it. I can't eat another bite. See, I've been that full, too. On one of our other camping trips, we got back and we went to a, a, a Chinese buffet, all you can eat. And so I got one plate after another, after another, after another. And before too long, you know, I had this little protrusion coming out of my stomach. And I know it's very intemperate, but I was young. <laughs> Nobody laughed at that one. <laughs> I'm still young, nevertheless. Anyway, you know, I think, I think it was after the fourth or fifth plate, this is not including dessert, that I was just like, oh, I cannot eat another bite. But then, you know, they had the, the cookies and the dessert up there too, and the pudding, and I just had to look at it and just say, no, I cannot eat another bite. Proverbs 27, verse 7, the full soul loathes the honeycomb. But to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So what does it mean to be hungry? What does it mean when you're hungry? Lack of food, lack of nutrition, there's an emptiness. 
and your stomach, and so you're full, or so you're hungry. And your body wants to fill that hunger. In the Bible, there's a word that's almost always associated with hunger. Who knows what it is? Besides Jenny and Wyatt. <laughs> Anybody? It could be. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 16, verse 3. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, this is speaking of the Israelites. It says, For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So the, child, the, uh, the Israelites are out in the wilderness and they're complaining about being hungry. And so what does the Lord do for them? Read in verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Again, in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 15, it's speaking of the same instance. It says, you gave them bread for their hunger. So they said they were hungry, and God gives them bread. In Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 9, it says, my Lord, the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon, and he is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is. Why? Why is he likely to die there? It says, for there is no more bread in the city. So I think we found the word that's most closely associated with hunger in the Bible, and that is bread. So when there is a lack of bread, what do you have? You have hunger. The full soul loathes the honeycomb. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. You see, it's funny that, you know, we, the, the Holy Spirit, even we say Jesus is the author of the Old Testament and speaks of this bread as satisfying hunger. But let's read the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 6. In verse 35, he said, uh, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So hunger is a lack of bread. And when you're hungry, even bitter things can taste sweet. So spiritual hunger, thank you, You got to love this, this weather, right? <laughs> so spiritual hunger is a lack of spiritual bread. And then even the bitter things taste sweet. See, I think this verse applies so much to many of our lives. Before I became a, a, a dedicated, devout Christian, I still... Would call, I still called myself, I identified as a Christian. But the bitter things of this world is what was sweet to me. I lived my life chasing worldly pleasures that are temporary in this world. You know, the, the money, the, a good career, education. And it wasn't until later in my life that I, I found out that those things Although some of them may be good, but for the most part were bitter, and I was allowing that bitterness to fill me because I was hungry. I mean, have you ever stopped and wondered why some people do the things that they do? You know, why, why does somebody live an immoral lifestyle? You know, if they, they've repented and come away from it, they can look back and say, you know, why, why did I do that? It's because... They were hungry at the time. And so it tasted sweet to them. Somebody who's been an alcoholic or on drugs looks back and says, you know, why? Why did I do that? It's because they were hungry 
and the bitter things tasted sweet to them. See, Satan knows those who are hungry. It says he seeks around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's searching out those people that are hungry, and he offers to fill that hunger with the bitter things of this world. And once we're filled with the bitterness, then we no longer have that desire or that hunger for the bread of heaven. So that's the problem we run into. And does Scripture give us the cure? Well, it sure does. So it says, The full soul loathes the honeycomb. How are you full this morning? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, so Satan offers to fill us with the bitter things, but Jesus also offers to fill us with his fullness. And John chapter 1 says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. So if you're filled with the bread of heaven, the bitter things lose their appeal to you. But you see, the the problem that I was running into is that knowing Jesus is not the same as being filled with Jesus. And I'm actually uh, thinking of another verse that would fit really good there. Let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I was reading this last night and it thought that it would go uh, very good with with this sermon here. You see, knowing Jesus is not the same as being filled with Jesus. And we find that Jesus' own disciples had this very same problem. Let's pick it up in verse verse 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You see, so they were still seeking after that tangible fullness, that uh, earthly fullness of literal bread. See, that it says that they were going after Jesus to get more food. But he says, you didn't seek me because of the signs. You seeked me because I filled your bellies. In verse 27, he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And then let's skip down to verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You see, even in Jesus' day, when he walked among them, there were people that were filling themselves with the worldly things, the bread of this life, the bread that perishes, the food that perishes. But Jesus was offering something much better. Having the ability to speak God's word is not being filled with God. 
Having 50% of your life connected with Christ is not to be filled with him. Too many times we try to give a partial effort and we expect to get a full result. Now we say that in, in, a, in a spiritual term, but in, in, a, in a real world sense, how many times have you went to go fill your car up and you only fill it halfway full? Do you expect to get a full tank's worth of mileage from that tank? If you needed to go 400 miles and your car could do that on one tank and you filled it halfway up, are you going to reach your destination? You're not going to make it. We can't expect the same thing to happen in our walk with Christ. We can't expect to give a partial effort and expect to get the full amount in return. I mean, you, you may have tried it. You may have said, you know, I'm going to get a little bit involved in church. Maybe this seminar sparked, you know, some revival in you, and you said, yes, I'm going to start participating. I'm going to be there. But yet you're still not giving the full effort. Maybe there's people in your life that you could be witnessing to. People in your life that you know deep down in your heart that they need to learn about the love of God. But yet we're not doing it. It says the full, see, once you have the fullness of Jesus, that's when the life begins to change. Some people ask, uh, me and my wife, I'm sure they ask Jenny and Wyatt the same thing, that it, is it hard to do what you guys do? You know, we don't, we don't have, a, well, we have a home. It's parked out behind the church, but we have no stationary home. I used to have some land. It's being in the process of being sold now. But when we leave the church, our next home is the next church or the next parking lot or the next Walmart parking lot or wherever we park our RVs for the night, that's, that, that is our home. And people ask, is it hard to do what you do, to have that no stability? And as, as from their point of view, they see no stability. And if you would have asked me that same question two years ago, I probably would have gave the same answer, that it, it seems so unstable. I mean, I how could I do that? How could I travel and not have a stable home? But you know, when you're filled with the fullness of Christ and you're devoted, this is the life that we should be living. We should not be attached to the things of this earth. We have no stationary home to store up all these earthly treasures, and I praise God for that because we had a house, and it was full of stuff we never used, and it was a headache. And now, you talk to my wife now, I try to get rid of everything. I don't want to keep anything and she says I have some underlying issues with that from my childhood. That may be the case, but I, I praise God that I'm that way because I've lost attachment to the things of this earth, and I love it. But that, that, uh, that verse, it says, the full soul loathes the honeycomb. Let's, let's flip it around and look at it from another perspective. The full soul loathes the honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. So we've looked at the hungry soul can find the bitter things of this world sweet. But what does it mean to loathe the honeycomb? That word loathe, if you, if you get the original translation of that word, it actually means to trample underfoot or trodden underfoot, to trample it, to smush it. Loathe the honeycomb. Now, the honeycomb is supposed to be a good thing, right? You might be thinking that the word of God is a, a symbol of, or the honeycomb is a symbol of the word of God. But it's not. What does it say? It's sweeter than the honeycomb is the word of God. So when we look at what took place with the Israelites, when they were going to the land of Canaan, it was the land of what? The land of milk and honey. Both of those things are good things, right? The land of milk. How do you get milk? From cattle, right? And, and you could even say is land of milk. So mothers, they had, they had prosperity. In order for, for a mammal to, to give milk or even a human to give milk, 
There has to be there has to be birth. There has to be new life. That's what the milk is for, to nurture new babies. So it was the land of milk, which means it was a prosperous land. The land of milk and honey. How do you get honey? Have any beekeepers in here? From bees, right? And where do the bees get what they need to make the honey? Flowers. Flowers. So plants, vegetation. So it was the land of milk and honey, Milk representing the prosperity and the growth of the population and, and the honey representing the, the food and the plants and the, just the vegetation that they had. So both of those things, very good. But this verse, Proverbs 27, 7, says that the full soul will loathe the honeycomb. Do you think that must be pretty serious then? To loathe, to trodden underfoot something that is so good? To take one of the sweetest things out there, honey, and to put it under your foot. Purity, you wouldn't like that, would you? You like the honey, don't you? You like honey? Yeah? (laughs) But to take one of the sweetest things God has given us, to put it under your foot and say, I don't even need that. So when we're full of the Bible, even the good things of this earth lose their appeal to you. You see, I want to be so full of the bread of heaven that the things of this earth have no appeal to me, even the good things. When I was first attending my very first prophecy seminar, and my life was being changed dramatically. At this seminar, we have a, a motto that we, that we uh, say every night, but at the first seminar I attended, we had a song that we sang every single night, and I was going, and I was learning all these new things from the Bible, but this song was just drilled into my head, and it went like this. It said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. And look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That, could, that, that song could not be more true. From that first time that I stepped into that seminar to today, my life is a complete 180 in the other direction. The things that I loved to do, I now don't love them anymore. The things that I didn't enjoy doing, I now live to do. And it's because when we look into his face, when we have the fullness of Jesus Christ, we will begin to loathe the honeycomb, even the good things. You know, that actually makes me think of, uh, of Pastor's sermon last week, the, the, talking about the left water pot. See, the, the woman at the well went there for a purpose, right? And she was going to get water. Now, is getting water a bad thing? No, we need water, right? But when she beheld Jesus and she turned her eyes upon Jesus, what was the whole point of Pastor Sermon last week? What did she do? She left the water pot. Not saying that the water pot was bad, but her priority had changed. And, you know, I, I couldn't relate with that more than last year, I, have, I used to have this weekly gaming night with my family, and I was the biggest gaming addict you could have met. It didn't look like it from the outside, but if you went into my house, you'd see all my gaming systems and my computer, and it was always on and ready to game. And last year, I got a call from my family. We were having our weekly night gaming session. And we all got together online and into the chat rooms, and we were going to game for hours like we always did. And so they called me and they said, hey, are you getting on? And I I had completely forgotten about it, and I hadn't done it in uh, months, probably. And so they called me. It's like, hey, are you getting on tonight? I know you're not out doing whatever you're doing. You're home. And I said, "Uh, sure, I'll get on for a few minutes. Booted up the computer, got on, and within a couple minutes of playing the game, just had no joy in it. 
I, the things that I used to love, I used to live to be able to come home and just play my video games. And the more I played, the more I despised it. I was thinking, what am I doing? This isn't fun. This isn't what we're supposed to be doing. How is it that I could love it and live for it and do it hours and hours and hours before, but now I want nothing to do with it? The full soul loathes the honeycomb. So I have a couple questions for you this morning. Are you hungry? Or are you, are you full? Are you looking for something to fill your hunger that may be bitter? Or are you at this point saying that I'm so full of Christ that I don't even need the honeycomb? And that you find it loathes, loathsome. That's a word, right? Loathsome. I want you to ask yourself this question and be honest with yourself. It doesn't matter what, what, what the answer is to me. Just be honest with yourself. And consider how full are you today? If you find yourself answering that question and you say, I'm about 70% full. Say, God, fill me up. I want to be 100%. If you're at 90, 95%, full capacity today. I say pray to God and say, God, fill me to 100%, to overflowing. Because it's only when we're filled with Jesus to the top that the good things of this earth and the bad things and all the appeal that this world has to offer loses its attraction to us. And I'm going to close with Matthew chapter 12, a parable of the unclean spirit. It says, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Now we're assuming that an unclean spirit would be driven out of a man by the Holy Spirit, or by Jesus. And it says he's seeking rest and finds none. So we have a, we have a man here, who had the unclean spirit washed out of him. Verse 44 says, Then he says, that the spirit, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And it says the last state of the man is worse than the first. You see, being empty of all these worldly pleasures and these worldly attractions doesn't fill us. It's when we're filled with Christ. It says the state of that man is worse than the first. He emptied himself, got all cleaned, and just made room for more unclean spirits. Allowing God to cleanse our heart is the first step, but it's not the final step. A daily devotion and walk with Jesus and being filled with him. The Bible says, by beholding, we become changed. When we look full in his wonderful face, the things of this earth will grow strangely dim. You know, as um, my pianist gets up here, we're going to sing the, the, the closing hymn. But I'd like you to think about this great timeline that we live in. Imagine that I have a, a rope up here that starts and it goes and it goes down the aisles and it goes up and it goes down. And it goes out this back door and it just keeps going and it goes on for eternity. And that's the timeline of our life. We have eternity. But here on this earth, we have this little bitty little section right here, right at the beginning. And this is our life. This is our chance. This is our opportunity here on this earth to live for Jesus. And it couldn't be more portrayed better than by Jesus himself. It says when he was in the will, after he was baptized, it said the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. And what did Jesus, what, what did Jesus not do for 40 days while he was in the wilderness? He didn't eat. 
Do you think he was hungry? No. Well, the Bible says he was hungry. It says after fasting for 40 days, he was hungry. I would be, I'd be hungry too. Do you think he was tired and weak? He was. And what did Satan try to do? He says that if you're the, the son of God, you know, turn this into bread. And what was Jesus's, what was his reply? It is written what? But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. After this seminar, you're going to be tempted, and you may even be tempted now, but we find that during these seminars, people experience these little mini revivals in their life. We see it every time, and they're so excited, but that excitement doesn't have to fade when the seminar's over. Each morning you, when you wake up and that alarm clock goes off at 5.30 or 6, however early you get up expecting to do your morning prayer and devotions and you hit snooze. And it goes off again another 15 minutes and you hit snooze. And finally you wake up 8 o'clock, but it's, it's too late for morning devotions because now you've got to get breakfast ready. And so you, then the afternoon hits and you've missed your opportunity to witness to somebody. And then before you know it, it's in the evening time and it's... Uh, Time to get the kids ready for bed. And before you know it, the day's gone. It's over, and you won't get that day back. And you missed the opportunity to be walking with Christ, to be witnessing for him a day lost that could have been used for the kingdom. I'd like you to think about that and consider, how are you full this morning? Are you empty? And are you looking for something to fill you that may be bitter? Let us sing our closing hymn and let this hymn be your prayer this morning.
bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Let that be our prayer today. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord my God, we, we come before you today empty and hungry and wanting to be filled. Filled to the top, Lord. Wash us clean and then fill us to overflowing with the bread of heaven with your word so that we lose our desire and our appeals or our attraction to the things of this earth and we live each day in a close, devoted walk with you. Father, we ask for your blessings on this seminar. We ask that you help uh, revive us, keep us from getting sick, get these colds and these illnesses out of the way so that we can work with a clear mind for you, Lord. We ask blessing over, over the meal as we leave here in fellowship, and Lord, and we just ask blessing over each and every guest that is coming out to these seminars and attending, Lord. We just ask that they receive a blessing that they know and understand the love that you have for them. We thank you, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.